Thank you uh, to, to Kevin and also to Brian uh, for those great introductions and, and for inviting me here. It's really been a couple of days and I uh, feel very, very privileged to have had the chance to get to know a number of the faculty that I've had discussions with. It's really been very invigorating and exciting for me and I look forward to, to more. As Brian was just mentioning, uh, I'm a historian and a theorist, uh, trained in architectural history and engage, engage very deeply in histories of environment, technology, media, communications, uh, and also, of course, in relationship to sort of broader fields of landscape, urbanism, and other design fields. I like to think of my specialization as the history of environmental culture, right, and certainly the role that design plays in that culture. My research plays this out uh, through two basic proposals on these terms. First, that the design fields, and I mean architecture, landscape, urbanism, even product design for that matter, have been a central site for the discussion of environmental issues. Right? And in particular, for speculation about how to live in an increasingly threatened and unpredictable future. So that's the sort of first basic framework, right? That it's been in design discussions, in conferences and texts and, and projects that generated out <coughs> of the design field, that a lot of very interesting discussions about the environment have emerged, right? really since the beginning of the 20th century, more aggressively since the middle of the post-war period. So that's the first point. Second, that this discussion of the environment and design's central place within it has been cultural as much as technological, right? And I emphasize that uh, because while there has rarely been a lot of emphasis in scholarship and in practice on how design technologies and methods can solve problems, right, help to save energy, reduce carbon emissions, reorganize cities, et cetera, what I'm interested in, in addition to these elements, <coughs> is the extent to which the design fields also intervene on cultural terms, right? This is, on the one hand, straightforward. The way we design the built environment informs how we live within it. And thinking about new ways of life is essential to meeting the environmental challenges we face. On the other hand, it gets a little more complex, or at least a little more nuanced, as what I want to describe today, for example, demonstrates that the technologies that we often identify as useful in increasing energy efficiency are also, in fact, effective in encouraging new aspirations, exploring new ways of living, and gathering new social collectives that view the world in novel ways. So the stakes of these discussions are quite high. Right? And I'm convinced that by crafting new narratives, as I want to give you a sort of taste of today, from a wider range of evidence of kind of how architectural uh, thinking has transformed, by telling new stories about design and its interconnections to other fields, by developing, in short, a comprehensive history of environmental design, practitioners, teachers, and especially students will have new opportunities to view their field and to view their future uh, in different ways. What I want to do this afternoon is present a case study from my forthcoming book that elaborates on and clarifies some of these proposals and begins to craft a new narrative. The book is called A House in the Sun, Modern Architecture and Solar Energy in the Cold War. Uh, it's got a release date of August 1st, so you know, look out for it. The book discusses a number of innovations and interventions in the immediate post-World War II period, uh, basically 43 into the early 60s, uh, that focused on how buildings, and in particular houses, could be designed according to their energy efficient potential. Now this was not, as I've already sort of described in my sort of broader uh, sensibility, this was not just about new kinds of architecture, but also about new conceptions of how to live in the expanding American suburbs, new approaches to technology, and about how these shifts in perspective led to a broader transformation on the level of what we could call politics for how individuals and collectives can express their desire for new relationships between human and natural systems, right? In other words, what we now call environmentalism. Okay, so to jump in, I'm gonna read, uh, read this pretty carefully here. In 1957, the office of Charles and Ray Eames produced what they called the Solar Do-Nothing Machine. Developed as part of a market marketing campaign for the Aluminum Company of America, it consisted of a 24-inch elliptical aluminum platform supporting moving pinwheels and star shapes, all made of brightly colored and anodized aluminum. On the side, as you see, a freestanding reflector screen of polished aluminum strips 
captured sunlight and reflected it in onto 12 photovoltaic cells, converting sunlight into electricity. As Life magazine noted in 1958, quote, the toy has no use and is not for sale. However, it is going on a national tour as an enchanting harbinger of more useful sun machines of the future. On the one hand, this project is a concise expression of the place of solar power that solar power occupied in the prolifer proliferation of energy infrastructure right after World War II. In the context of strategic development of a global oil network, of investment in nuclear power, and of a dramatic increase in electrical grids and natural gas pipelines, the mid-century interest in solar energy seems to have been able to do, if not exactly nothing, uh, certainly very little. On the other hand, the solar do-nothing machine indicates the historical emergence of a new perspective on the machine and on the relative utility of architecture, on the ability of a solar machine and of energy technologies more generally to do something and to bring about more useful architectures for the future. Such concerns lead us first to the historical interventions of Ringer Bannum. Starting in the mid-1950s, Bannum's writing, as many of you no doubt know, reconsidered the relationship between architecture and the machine. Most significantly, Bannum reread the history of interwar modernism for, rather than as a triumph of the machine aesthetic, right, as he referred to it, for what he considered a, quote, selective and classicizing, end quote, engagement with technology, one that was, continuing to quote Bannum, nowhere near an acceptance of machines on their own terms, end quote. Modern architects, according to Bannum, had explored the image and the form of technology, but not the potential of technological innovations to reorganize the place of architecture in the wider social field. At stake was not only a new critical framework for analyzing the history of architecture, but also the prospects for the field to remain relevant in a rapidly technologizing world. Bantam's polemic was summarized in a frequently quoted passage from the conclusion of his 1960 book, uh, the book was titled Theory and Design in the First Machine Age. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. This oft-quoted passage, the architect who proposes to run with technology knows that he, right, uh, sick, will be in fast company, and that in order to keep up, he may have to discard his whole cultural load, including the professional garments by which one is recognized as an architect. On the East Coast, I always make a joke about wearing black hair. But, uh, if, on the other hand, he decides not to do this, he might, may find that a technological culture has decided to go on without him. In the years that followed, Bannum went, off to Bannum went on to celebrate the work of both Mr. Fuller, the Archogram Collective, the Metabolist Movements, among many other designers running with technology, for their capacity to rethink the purview of architecture and its forms of social engagement. I rehearsed Bannum's well-known polemic today because we are again, as a discipline, caught amidst the complications of our cultural load, right? the traditions and assumptions that inform architectural research and design, and the almost blinding promise of technology. Architects are again considering how technology can best elaborate on predetermined notions of architectural innovation, and how technology can begin to reconsider disciplinary assumptions that open the field to other influences. As these issues have returned, they have attained, as we all well know, heightened stakes. We are no longer concerned with simply keeping up with a rapidly expanding technological culture, but rather with finding cultural and technological means of mitigating the environmental crises which we all, as designers, as historians, and as citizens, which we all are increasingly compelled to address. It's on these terms that I want to expand on Bam's polemic and add to his concerns over architecture's place in a technological culture that of the discipline's historical role in the politics of environmental change. As we rethink the role of history and theory in training architects as environmental designers, the role of design in negotiating between culture, technology, and politics, I'm going to argue, becomes increasingly relevant. I'm going to focus my comments this afternoon on this house. The Dover Sun House, as it was called, designed by the Boston architect Eleanor Raymond and the engineer Maria Telkish in 1948, was the best known of a surprising variety of solar houses built during and right after World War II. 
a few of which we will glimpse in a moment. Even here, this house was distinct in being an all-solar house. Right? In the frigid winter outside Boston, the house had no traditional furnace to augment its innovative solar heating system. The design and technology of the house, as we can already sort of glean from looking at its somewhat awkward profile, was focused on its performative potentials. Before detailing the house and its significance, I want to address a question that some of you may have already been wondering about. Why would such a house focused on design for renewable energy be built in a post-war period, a historical period usually characterized as one of abundant energy and endless economic growth? As a number of historians are beginning to recognize, the period from the end of the war, the end of World War II, the mid-40s, until about 1953, which is to say until the extent of Middle East oil reserves became known, this period was one of significant concern over the future availability of energy resources. This map, for example, published in the Chicago Tribune in 1948, you can see that the relative extent of the Middle Eastern oil fields is you know, wildly underestimated. I mean, that bar should kind of go up to the, I don't know, we only have three floors, it probably needs like four or five to really encompass the amount of oil that is actually there. So a sort of indication of the state of knowledge and the anxiety that was related to it. Uh, Harold Ickish, the longtime US Secretary of the Interior, Interior wrote an article in 1943 entitled, We're Running Out of Oil! Exclamation point, right? Uh, lamenting that domestic energy reserves had been bankrupted, as he put it, by the prodigal harvest needed to win the war. Concern, concern over energy availability ran deep into US government agencies and numerous industries. Alongside well-known efforts to expand oil, nuclear, and hydroelectric capacity, research funding was also pointed towards harnessing geothermal energy, extracting oil from shale, and attempts to generate energy from wind. And we, excuse me, see here on the left an, an experimental uh, shale, uh, shale fuel experimentation installation, right, on the western slope of Colorado, and then this rather gargantuan uh, idea for an experimental uh, wind generator, right? But hopefully it was going to power more than a little house, right? Never, 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 never In any event, these ideas were proliferating and circulating amongst policy circles, uh, design circles, uh, technology circles, as we'll see. The concern over the resource limits of the Earth and the relative costs and benefits of technological means to overcome them were prominent themes in American cultural discussions just after the war ended. In 1948, the same year that the Dover House was built, Fairfield Osborne's Our Plundered Planet and William Vogt's Road to Survivor, Survival sorry, were both bestsellers. These books focused on what they saw as the potentially unsettling interconnections between limited food supply, exponential population growth, and rising industrial pollution. Both also focused on, quote, the promise of technology, as Osborne put it, to provide for the continuation of civilization, right? So again, no small stakes there. The promise of technology was, of course, another well-known post-war theme, and one that was often focused on the house. In this 1946 image on the left uh, from Life magazine, all of the amenities that wartime technology was seen to promise, right, as the factories retooled for domestic use, uh, the dreams of 1946, as the kind of small print there uh, describes, were displayed on this spacious front yard, right? So you kind of see all the appliances arrayed, and of course the helicopter above, uh, we're still waiting. Uh, on the right, Ralph Rapson's 1945 case study house, some of you may know it, also referred to as the Greenbelt House, unbuilt but widely influential, brought some of these issues into focus for architects. As Esther McCoy has written, Rapson's drawing, quote, describes well the yearnings of the mid-1940s, uh, end quote, for new technologies, for new ways of living, though Rapson's money, McCoy continued, was on the wrong machine, uh, by which she is indicating that the husband, as we can see, commuting home from work in his personal helicopter, I have left mine outside, uh, you know, a luxury that's not quite been realized in, in the popular uh, realm, while the housewife hangs the laundry out to dry in the yard for raft of the soon-to-be ubiquitous automatic clothes dryer. So, you know, a bit of a complex set of post-war concerns on the table. Such images make visible the public and professional preoccupation over the trajectories of technological change, not just that technologies would develop, but how, and with what consequences. 
The singular event on these terms, of course, was the previously unimaginable destructive capacity of the atomic bombs that had ended World War II, seen as both an occasion to affirm the belief that the future would bring unforeseeable changes, and also as an occasion to question, with no small amount of trepidation, the kinds of futures that different technologies could bring about. It was in this broad context that a number of experts began in the late 1940s to analyze the global energy future in some detail and to consider the different technological trajectories that could be uh, put into play on these terms. The best known of these experts today is M. King Hubbard, whose theory of Hubbard's peak or peak oil, first developed in 1948, proposed that all extractable resources have a predictable point at which their extraction is no longer economically viable. And we can get into the sort of details of Hubbard's own kind of rise and fall like in many questions. More prominent in the period, however, was the research of Gulf Oil Executive Eugene Irons. In a keynote address to the American Petroleum Institute, also in 1948, Irons distinguished between what he called capital energy sources, based in accumulated energy stored underground, such as coal, oil, and even uranium, right? So uh, fossil fuels, among others, and income sources, such as solar, geothermal, and wind, that, given adequate research, could be used on a continuous basis. Ayers insisted that the hosts of technologists, as he called them, working on energy efficiency, should focus their efforts on income uh, research. In this image seen here, Ayers indicated how <coughs> moderate, how different sort of moderate or intensive research programs, right? You can see uh, this thing is a little feeble, but you different, you know, a sort of moderate research program into renewables would bring the fossil the life of fossil fuels a certain develop to a certain level more intensive relationship uh, sort of research into fossil into renewables with uh, continue the potential for fossil fuels later into the future. It was a novel perspective on resources and economic growth, right? This notion that the fossil that the moment of available oil was really a time to focus on renewable energy and think about different forms of power in the future and one that began to crack a door open into the entanglements between social priorities, environmental conditions, and flows of economics and politics. This mid-century interest in resources hung with an optimism that such entanglements could be engineered towards human benefit. This tiny period of Earth's life, Iris wrote in Scientific American in 1952, and I'm quoting, when we are consuming stored riches is over. But man's resourcefulness continues and becomes more potent, he concludes. Because of this, the future is bright. Iris's bright future was not only metaphoric, but also quite literal. In the same article in Scientific American, he focused his optimism on recent experiments in house heating that took advantage of abundant income energy falling to the earth from the sun. The title of his article that I show you, the first uh, spread up here, the title of the article, Windows, would seem to indicate an interest in the copious use of glass in the passive solar houses, most likely those designed by George Fred Keck, that had been dotting the Midwestern suburban landscape since just before the war. These houses, as you can see uh, in this slide, were narrow buildings with southern facades almost fully glazed with insulated glass panels and with precisely calculated roof overhangs, right, uh, as indicated, uh, which, which is indicated in these photographs uh, can allow the sun in in the winter and block the sun out in the summer. And just to note, for those of you who can determine those overhangs with like two or three keystrokes, it took uh, Keck about three and a half months working with uh, meteorologists at the Adler Planetarium to determine what the extent of that overhang should be, right, to block the sun at the right time. Uh, though Keck was the most prolific, the interest in passive solar housing uh, preoccupied the architectural profession more generally. Lou Kahn and Oscar Stonerop's Solar House in Pennsylvania, designed for a glass industry publication in 1946, was one impressive example. Houses by Gropius, Breuer, and here by the Architects Collaborative were also sensitive to solar patterns and saw in modern techniques the capacity to integrate ways of living with seasonal changes. One could also look to many of the Usonian houses of Frank Lloyd Wright, which oriented their glazed facades according to solar exposure and filled them with brick, stone, and other thermally active materials. But Ayers, despite his title of Windows, 
was more interested in active solar heating systems. The Dover Sun House was especially enticing. With a bank of glass plate solar collectors, not windows, right, uh, on the second floor, the house used an innovative phase change system to collect and store solar radiation. Phase change compounds, as some of you no doubt, no doubt know, change from solid to liquid at a given temperature. Here, the engineer, Maria Telkish, with much concentration, is demonstrating that as these compounds melt, the heat is absorbed into a liquid state and stored, right? And then when the temperature around them cools, the compounds recrystallize and the heat is released, right? So it's basically a, a system of storing heat through a, a chemical reaction. Telkish was part of a solar energy research institute that had started right before the war in the Department of Mechanical, Engine of Mechanical Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In 1947, Telkish was instrumental in building this small experimental structure intended to test the viability of the phase change process for space heating. Here again, what may look like a bank of windows is actually a series of heating panels the glass, the exterior facade of seven thermally isolated cubicles, right? So basically, we're not going to get into the details, but each cubicle was sort of testing a different set of experimental parameters to determine the optimum uh, collection and storage system. In this first building, Telkish devised an integrated solar collection and storage unit she called the vertical south panel. Solar radiation would first heat the air that occupied the space between the glass panel and the vertical container of phase change compounds. Okay, so what we've got here is a sheet of glass, of insulated glass, with an airspace between, and then a sort of metal extended uh, canister that holds these, uh, this chemical solution. The first stage of the process is to allow the sun to heat up that airspace, right, and sort of generate uh, some intensity in the heating in that space. And that air would in turn heat the salts, right, that are in this sort of extended uh, canister uh, unit. When they reached phase change temperature, these salts would liquefy and store the heat. Then when the sun went down, a curtain would be drawn into the airspace to keep the chemicals in their liquid state, right, to continue that storage process. <clears throat> as the interior cooled, the compounds would recrystallize, so as the air on the inside began to, to chill, uh, the compounds would recrystallize and then emanate that heat into the space. If necessary, that the curtain could be drawn to turn off the heat as desired, right? So there was something of a, you know, some amount of control. The experiment didn't go very well. The phase change temperature proved difficult to maintain, the chemical compounds stratified and lost effectiveness, and the vertical containers corroded, cracked, and leaked. Beyond these technological issues, personal animosity between Talkish and her collaborator, collaborators led to poor monitoring and lax maintenance. There was little institutional impetus, in other words, to make the system work. Indeed, declaring the experiment a misconceived failure, the director, and there was a lot of uh, gender issues and sort of anti-communist bias going on here. This is a complex scenario, but I'm summarizing that as this notion of uh, calling it a misconceived failure. The director of the MIT research group decided to renovate the building without Telkish, using a previously tested system in which the rooftop panels heated water and stored it in an insulated tank. We can see this very diagrammatically. I'd be happy to return to go over the details. Uh, but that basically the sun uh, heated these, this, this panel system. You can see them up here. Uh, heated the panel here, brought the water into this very heavily insulated tank, and then distributed that heated water through ceiling panels. An incredibly inefficient way to heat a space, of course, uh, but uh, was an efficient way to transmit that heat to a heating system. Um, this house, which was also completed in 1948 and also discussed in articles, Iyer, in Iyer's article, demonstrated the success of this water-based heating system, but was ridiculously expensive and reliant on supplementary sources to get this very happy family through the winter. So already, we see some of the complex historical contingencies that impose upon the potential of a given technology. We see the way technologies emerge out of complex cultural and social practices. Telkish, to her credit, was undeterred by her rejection from the MIT group. She turned significantly to an architect, right? Having previously collaborated with the architect Eleanor Raymond on the solar efficiency of a local greenhouse, Telkish contacted Raymond to explore how a new design approach could improve the phase change system. 
Raymond was by then well known for adapting new forms and materials to the specific conditions of New England. Her 1931 house here on the left, designed for her sister, was one of the first modern buildings uh, in New England. Raymond's plywood house of 1940, seen on the right, was celebrated as the first anywhere to use plywood as a primary building material. She was also knowledgeable about traditional means to manage solar incidents and other climate conditions, as evidenced in her exhaustive survey of vernacular structures in her 1931 publication, Early Domestic Architecture in Pennsylvania. Raymond's designs, placed here uh, next to the contemporaneous work of Walter Gropius, begin to help us see the Dover House as also part of a broad interest in modulating the international style according to specific regional concerns. At Telkish's urging, Raymond convinced Amelia Peabody, her client for the Plywood House and numerous other projects, to sponsor a phase change experiment on one of the numerous Peabody estates. A more considered architectural approach here became instrumental to the problem of solar heating. In the first place, Raymond insisted that, quote, from the architect's point of view, <clears throat> oops, sorry, it was unfortunate to give up any part of the south wall to predetermined use, as you saw the initial MIT experiment had done. Telkish responded with an important innovation to her system. She separated the solar absorption panel, right, that gathers the, uh, the radiation from the sun, from the, the, the panel that c contains the uh, chemical, the phase change chemicals that will store that heat and release it into the house. Basically using fans to draw the heat from the collector to the storage area, uh, she also ended up doubling right, the sort of radiant effects that this storage unit could have on the interior space, doubling the surface area uh, through which this heat could emanate. In the first scheme for the Dover House from February of 1948, Raymond placed the collector on a setback A-frame roof, you can see that in red here, <clears throat> with chemical heat storage in heat bins along the central axis. The basic premise was refined in a second and final scheme from August of the same year. Here, Raymond made the plan longer and much more narrow, placing all of the living areas to the south and leaving them open to passive heat gain. In stretching out the plan, she also significantly enlarged the, co the collector area. And finally, in this scheme, the heat bins are more precisely calibrated to load, right? You might not have noticed, but before they were all the same size. Here they're larger in the bedroom, smaller in the places that are used during the day. So this new system worked more or less as follows. The double plane pane glass on the collector area you can see from the far right there sat in front of a thin air cavity, faced on the other side by a carbon black metal sheet to increase heat absorption. Solar radiation heated up in this small airspace uh, uh, and then was blown by fans into the heat bins below, right, uh, in those various uh, heat bin spaces. The salts in the bins would liquefy and store heat. As the interior of the house cooled, the salts recrystallized and their heat was released. A fan circulation system, basically a forced air system, would then distribute this warm air throughout the house. The quantity of salts was such that following a few sunny days of heat storage, it was hoped the house could be comfortably heated for three days without sunshine. These refinements of the phase change system, dependent upon the integration of the technological proposal into the architectural treatment of the house, right, the sort of collaboration on these very specific terms, greatly increased the performance of the system. As before, however, there were a multitude of problems. The biggest issue was that the intense heat in the collector led to the caulk sealant on the panel drying out, and thus to persistent leaks, both water getting in and heat getting out. A combination of Telkish's advocacy and Peabody's ample resources allowed for these problems to be, for a time, withstood. Every summer, the entire system was rebuilt. The, start, the salts were replaced, the glass panel was completely disassembled, recalked, and put back into place. Right, so a pretty heavy maintenance regime, it's called. It is also worth noting that the house was lived in uh, by cousins of Telkish, who were sympathetic to the cause. As Peabody wrote in a letter to Raymond in 1952, they were, quote, frequently heroic in withstanding bitter temperatures. And there's uh, evidence of them you know, using the stove and sleeping in the kitchen, basically, so that they can stay warm at night. In the spring of 1954, after a particularly difficult winter, Peabody finally gave up. 
We have proven, proven, she said to the Boston Globe, we have proven that solar living is possible, though it is not very comfortable. The experiment, she concluded, is over. Despite these complications, and indeed before many of them were known, the house opened to great acclaim in March of 1949. It received numerous accolades in the professional and popular press, from heating and ventilating news to progressive architecture to the Saturday Evening Post. The formal awkwardness of the house was accepted, even celebrated, as a symbol of its capacity to address concerns over energy sources. As Life Magazine proposed in this article, of the world's first sun-heated home, Though it looked like a, quote, modern house with a superimposed chicken coop, it may turn out to be historic, end quote. When Raymond was made a fellow of the AIA in 1950, the Dover House was cited as one of her most important accomplishments. In 1952, Telkish was given the first Society of Women Engineers Achievement Award based on the house's perceived success. Before going on to explore some of the wider effects of the house, I want to suggest that even though we might see the project, Passe on Manum, as threatening to have run with technology at the expense of familiar architectural garments, the careful integration of architecture and technology in the Dover Sun House made it an important cultural event. Much as with other demonstration houses of the late 1940s, including Breuer's House and Museum Garden that you see on the bottom here, uh, uh, and the prefabricated Lustron houses shown around the Northeast, visitors flocked to the Dover House in order to expand their sense of what sort of life might be available to them now that wartime restrictions had ended. We can further place the house next to contemporaneous explorations of the use of glass to mediate the experience, the experience of nature. We see here both Philip Johnson's house and Paulo Soleri's uh, desert project, of course, very different houses in many ways. Uh, houses articulated as lifestyle experiments and received in public discourse as productive challenges to familiar perceptions of how a house should look and how one would live differently in a technological culture. It's worth knowing that Solari's house, as Arthur Drexler tells us, was intended to be equipped, I'm quoting, sorry, was intended to be equipped with portable chemical packages for supplying heat on cold desert evenings, end quote. And that Johnson's <coughs> famous house uh, had its roots not only in his well-documented attention to Nice, not to mention Ledoux, but also, as I've demonstrated at length elsewhere, in his 1946 model for a passive solar house, published in Ladies Home Journal and then exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art. We can also place the Dover House in the context of a number of related solar experiments in the period. Though not realized in built form until the mid-1960s, Felix Trom had begun to experiment with what came to be called Trom walls, right, for obvious reasons, uh, thick membranes with thermally active materials in the early 1950s. MIT experiments were also ongoing, as you can kind of see across the bottom of this slide, focused now on the ideal envelope for solar absorption and storage, resulting in another MIT-sponsored house in 1957. So this was the fourth MIT house, the solar house that was built. But this shows kind of some of the types of uh, uh, design experimentation that was going on to think about how the house could be best organized for solar absorption, right, and even sort of heat storage in that slight uh, sort of underground space there. The engineer, George Loff, anybody gonna say, oh yeah, him, no, maybe? He's a Boulder native, uh, worked in Denver for a long time, uh, known to you perhaps for his house in Cherry Hill that was just taken down in, I think, 2006, uh, designed with the Boulder architect Peter Hunter in 1957, uh, one of the uh, most prominent sort of solar experiments in the 1950s that became a kind of pilgrimage site for a lot of architects in the 70s, uh, looking to looking again to solar. Uh, but uh, Locke was experimenting with what he called an overlapped plate collector. I won't get into the technical details, but here he is trying it out on the roof of the chemistry building. Uh, I think it might have even been just kind of went up there with some grad students and built the thing, right? Uh, and then in his house in Boulder, which had these uh, solar collection panels and then stored the heat in uh, river pebbles in the basement. And in fact, the Denver house that he built had these great sort of ornamental columns that were filled with river pebbles that were uh, the kind of insulated heat storage system uh, for that house. But the Dover Sun House continued to be a special case. <coughs> From its opening uh, until the early 1950s, uh, which is to say again before its kind of 
complete lack of technological viability was understood. It was widely celebrated as a working example of the potential of income energy sources to reorganize social patterns and priorities. In the context of the concern over resources that I've described, it also illuminates environmental and political dimensions of technological choices. A 1949 cover story in Popular Science <coughs> claimed that the House held, quote, the key to economies in home heating and in the world's fuel supply. And as the article continued, quote, while the House cannot compete in drama with the towering cloud of death that rose over Hiroshima, the sun furnace, referring to this house, may be the more important portent of the two. A hyperbolic statement, to be sure, but one not completely out of place amidst the concerns of the period. The House's insertion into the resource discussion was both as a technological response to resource pressures, which is to say it seems to be increasing energy efficiency, and also as a creative means to open up these discussions around resources to the viability of unanticipated alternatives. We have to recall that in the late 1940s, there was no environmental movement as such, and one can get into the detail of the sort of legacy of the conservation movement, uh, certainly. Uh, but it, even that expressed a different kind of social desire, right? This question of, of sort of viability of new alternatives was not about preserving existing relationships with nature, but about approaching the future with renewed awareness of the manifold interconnections between ecologies and economies, between social and biological systems. The Dover House was an important element in, and at times a catalyst for, thinking creatively about the environment on these new terms. In the fall of 1949, for example, Telkish presented the house at what's called the United Nations Scientific Conference on the Conservation and Utilization of Resources. One of the first gatherings of scientists, kind of one of the first UN-generated environmental uh, group, uh, sort of uh, global meetings of environmentally focused uh, scientists, policymakers and technologists uh, trying to discuss these questions on systematic terms. The New York Times reported that after seeing Telkish's presentation, then U.S. Interior Secretary Julius Krug, quote, placed solar energy high on the list of possibilities that might have a tremendous bearing on the resources of the country, end quote. The House was also featured in a 1951 Truman Administration report that you just see the cover up on the side here called Resources for Freedom. So again, an integration, right, into these sort of Cold War political uh, complications. This document attempting to take an inventory of what they call, quote, the combined material requirements and supplies of the entire free non-communist world, end quote, similarly saw the House as, a, as demonstrating that solar energy was, to quote them again, the most important contribution technology can make to the materials problem, end quote. As this latter example in particular begins to indicate, with imported oil pouring into the US by the early 1950s, Concerns over resources migrated from encouraging suburban growth to asserting geopolitical dominance. Solar technologies became an important part of US and UN supported programs of technical assistance. The proliferation of systems and objects developed for these programs, and the array of corporate, government, and nonprofit foundation support that engendered it, was remarkably dynamic. Telkish again played an important role. Here we see some of the dynamism, right, these kind of extremes. Of, of, of populations being addressed. Now based in NYU, Talkish's research spanned from solar ovens, shown here on the right in a, in a demonstration to the US Foreign Operations Administration, and on the left, an experimental oven in Pakistan. Uh, uh, she also looked at devices for rendering salt water potable, uh, for solar intensification of algae growth as a food source, and many other potential applications. The flexibility and user-friendly potential of solar technology and its seeming appropriateness to the low-tech needs of the so-called underdeveloped sun-rich regions of the global south led the Eisenhower administration to propose in late 1944 what they called a, quote, world solar energy project, end quote. The project intended to gather together growing solar knowledge as a means to, to quote again, provide opportunities for cooperative international effort while also reducing suspicion and tensions among nations. 
right? So sort of use this kind of beneficent, potentially beneficent technology as a means to gather a set of unaffiliated uh, political entities into the sort of broader non-communist envelope, right, that was also being promoted. Though this project was not pursued, this World Solar Energy Project was not pursued directly as policy, one result was that solar energy technologies, including this fascinating phase change house built in Casablanca in 1957 for a Department of Commerce uh, trade show, uh, joined other demonstrations of American technological prowess and exhibitions, initiatives, and aid programs around the world. Solar technologies became central to the development of practical knowledge and to the dissemination of American influence not only as a means to improve economic opportunities, but also, uh, as I've just noted, in order to secure the political affiliation of unallied nations as the Cold War was heating up. So I've detailed the Dover House and its effects in some detail in order to augment Bannum's already expanded criteria for architectural innovation and because it allows me to extract two frameworks relevant to reconsidering the historical patterns, methods, and landmarks of 20th century architecture. The first of these frameworks is to indicate that all technologies develop in relationship to contingent cultural and political factors. As Weba Beaker and John Law, two historians of technology, have written, the idea of a pure technology is nonsense. Right? That's nice and succinct, right? Keeps us on our toes as they continue seemingly referring to the complications of the Dover House that I've just described, quote, a technological trajectory is the project of heterogeneous contingency. Politics, economics, theories of the strength of materials, notion about, notions about what is beautiful or worthwhile, professional preferences, prejudice and skills, design tools, and so on, all of these are thrown into the pot whenever an artifact is designed or built. From this perspective, much of the story of the Dover House is how it was made to work, right? Propped up by excessive investment, continuous maintenance, and aggressive, aggressive advocacy amidst a brief historical moment of receptive political conditions. This same principle, of course, could be applied to the global infrastructure of oil. The complications of politics, economics, and energy were in this case resolved through military threats, careful diplomacy, and emergent political forms of clandestine infiltration, including most dramatically the 1953 CIA organized coup in petroleum rich Iran. Oil, as well, has for decades been made to work through an arrangement of hidden costs and incentives, the fragility of which we are just now, or at least in the last few decades, beginning to understand. We've also seen that, and this is my second framework, while the Dover House had some important effects, resolving concerns over energy sources was not one of them. Though we've become accustomed to seeing technology as a way out of political and social problems, the significance of the house lies elsewhere. Rather than resolving social and environmental complica complications, we can recast these technological interventions for how they facilitated new spaces for debate, for speculation, and for restructuring collective visions of the future. The reception of the Dover House was in this sense embedded in a much more broadly conceived world solar energy project, an attempt to articulate an alternative set of political organizations focused on the relationship between technology, culture, and environmental change. On the one hand, again, this is straightforward. New technologies can empower individuals and collectives by helping them to see new possibilities and to agitate for change. On the other hand, it is a bit more complex, as the contingencies of technological developments face attempts to articulate and facilitate alternative desires and alternative ways of life. So to conclude and kind of uh, indicate some of the effects, broader effects of this question, in the 1950s, a broad international scientific and political community began to mobilize around the potential of solar technological innovation and was essential to the emergence of now think of environmentalism, right? And that's in many ways the sort of large scale argument of my book is that these houses were essential to this broad based sense of how to think about the world on environmentalist terms. Events such as the 1954 Conference on Wind and Solar Energy in New Delhi, the 1955 World Symposium for Applied Solar Energy Conference that we see here, at which Lofts, the model of Lofts House was uh, you know, of much interest to this family. Uh, 
1961 conference on new sources of energy run by the UN in Rome, and the 1968 conference in Paris on energy in the biosphere, to name just a few of the sort of broad array of UN supported and foundation supported discussions around renewable energy technologies, all explored the cultural and political possibilities of technological innovations. Central to all of these meetings were attempts to think through how the flexibility of solar energy applications allowed for patterns of economic and technological development to be more sensitive to a wider range of social and environmental conditions, right? So not just sort of one flow of a kind of oil-dominated system, but regionally appropriate technologies that can emerge uh, on, on different terms. This historical thread could, in some ways, be continued to encompass the formation of the UN Environmental Program at the Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm in 1972, the introduction of sustainability as a concept in the Brunswick Report of 1986, and onto the Rio Earth Summit, the International Panel on Climate Change, and other advocates that have since 1988 in particular been focusing on this question of how to understand and impact the changing climate that of course came to something of a head, perhaps, we hope, in the Paris Accords last December. While we have many reasons to critique the limitations of these organizational bodies and their attendant regulatory regimes, they have certainly succeeded in opening up a new political space, allowing new voices to be heard and new visions of the future to be expressed. In this broadly conceived world solar energy project, this global debate over the consequences of technological choices, architecture has played an important role. Though the solar houses I have discussed ultimately did little on technological terms and seemingly did nothing to the global infrastructure of oil, they do something rather significant to the history of architecture. The connections between culture, technology, and environmental change that I've suggested today allow us to follow Bannum to again reconsider the historical narratives relevant to architectural practice. The projects I have focused on saw in the design possibilities of emergent technological strategies, a means to constitute new social conditions, right? So the kind of deployment of technology on these very broad terms, with new relationships to material and energy resources, to political debates and economic systems, and towards different ways of living. As we strive to develop responses to climate change and other changes in the environment, one of the most important issues we face is how to convince people to live differently. Practitioners and pedagogues focused on the built environment have a crucial role to play here, or really, I would suggest, two roles. To develop techniques and materials that can mitigate harmful impact on the environment, and to imagine alternative ways of living that can empower individuals and collectives to see their future in a different way. If history, as Bannum also wrote, quote, is our only guide to the future, end quote, I think we need to regard these solar do-something machines with cautious optimism. An optimism about new ways of constructing the past, rooted in a new perspective on the political dynamics of technological culture. This, perspective's, this perspective allows for a history of the design fields as a site for interdisciplinary discussions, for the negotiation of these myriad input, inputs, and as a site for the production of the environmental culture of the present, one that is resolutely focused on the changing contours of possible futures.